the time in the garden, the betrayal, the arrest and trial, the awful, awful crucifixion. And then the report from some of the women that Jesus had risen. What to make of it all? And besides the authorities, both the Jews and the Romans were upset and who knows what they would do. No wonder the disciples had locked themselves into a room, away, apart, fearful of those who had killed Jesus. They had, after all, walked alongside Jesus for three years. They had been out in public with him and engaged in his work. They could be identified with him. But perhaps along with grappling with that fear, they were wrestling with fear of their own, their own guilt and shame. They who had walked with Jesus and spoken so confidently had, in the end, when it mattered most, deserted him. Some even denied that they knew him. Layers and layers, fear, scorn, ridicule, anxiety, a sense of failure and shame, uncertainty about the future. What did it mean that Jesus had been raised from the dead? If he was no longer here, what had this whole thing been about? When tomorrow morning came, what would their lives be? They were not only shutting out the world, but also locking themselves in. And where was Thomas? Nowhere to be found, not in the garden when the resurrection was proclaimed, not on the road to Emmaus, not in the upper room with the others. He must have found a safe place to hide his grief and despair after the crucifixion. We've encountered Thomas before in the Gospels, when Jesus was about to go to Lazarus' home in Bethany, and everyone else was trying to talk him out of it because of the opposition facing him. It was Thomas who said, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus sat down at the Last Supper with his disciples and told them not to be afraid because they knew the way where he was going, it was Thomas who said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas, the one blurting out the questions we might have wanted to ask, one who was cautious, wanting something tangible, wanting something or someone he could touch before he was all the way in. And where are we? I suspect that we might be found among those disciples, facing fears, anxieties, trepidations, uncertainty, guilt, and shame. One way we deal with all this is like the disciples, to slam the door shut, to bolt up the locks on our hearts, hoping to be safe from the world, from all that is out there shutting ourselves in. We become the prisoners of our own sins, fears, and self-perceptions. Like the disciples, we try to hide from our shame and disappointment in ourselves by locking the doors to our hearts and not letting anyone in. This is particularly true if we've been hurt before. Each hurt is followed by another lock, another barricade on the door to our hearts. Even though we are afraid to let anyone in, we can put up a good front. The door is magnificent on the outside, but securely locked and impenetrable. On that first Easter Sunday, in the midst of all the disciples' fears and confusion, Jesus comes and stands among them. His words to them were, peace be with you. Not, you idiots, what were you thinking? Where were you when I needed you? I don't want to have anything more to do with you. Peace be with you. And he showed them his wounded hands and sighed. Wow, the women were right after all. It really was Jesus risen from the dead. Thomas missed out wherever he was, dealing with his own grief and guilt. He was not with the disciples when Jesus appeared to them to discover that his friends equally guilty, even equally grieving, had been visited by Jesus and given authority to continue the work Jesus had been doing was more than he could absorb or manage. Filled with shame, he blurts out, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands 
and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas won't believe it for himself. He certainly won't believe it from the mouths of his friends. But still he hangs around, even though he's convinced that nothing can ever get better for him, that he deserves nothing better. Then the next week Jesus appears again and greets the assembled group. Peace be with you. And immediately he invites Thomas to touch his wounds. Do not doubt, but believe. Like a dam bursting, Thomas's fear, grief, and shame flood out, and he collapses in adoration. My Lord and my God, peace be with you. Peace be with you. There's no little asterisk saying that this is available only to those who stay the course, who always do what they're supposed to do. There's no exclusion cause for, clause for those who have questions, for those who have feared, for those who just don't know quite how all this works or who this Jesus is. Peace be with you. Look around that room where the disciples were. See whom Jesus is addressing. I suspect we would fit right in. And I suspect too that we, as well as the disciples, are meant to hear Jesus' words. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. The locked door is opened. The disciples go out and witness to the risen Lord. Life is not all peaches and cream. The disciples get in trouble with the authorities. Persecution follows. But that sense of peace, that knowledge that Jesus goes with them, fills their lives. We are offered the same promise. Peace be with you. Fear, guilt, shame, doubt, anxiety. Peace be with you. Unlock that door. There is nothing to hold you in. Jesus goes with you. Nothing, not sin, not death, can bar the door. Jesus is risen, and in his life is our life. Then go and share that love, that life. Help others to unlock all those doors that kept them in. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.